the following Aussies all got in common. Ned Kelly, Kevin Rudd, Paul Keating, Peter Carey, Kylie Minogue, Errol Flynn, Russell Crowe, Jason Donovan, Tom Kennelly, Susie O'Neill, James O'Connor and Paul Hogan. The hint is in their names. What binds them together is food, or rather the lack of it. These Irish Australians are the result of a terrifying Malthusian warning to the world the Great Irish Famine. There can be fewer, more vicious ecological examples of what happens when a population gets too big to support itself than what happened to my own country years and years ago. This experience killed millions and scattered the Irish tribe all over the world, many of whom are in the audience tonight. Quite apart from destroying your good-looking genes, keeping you up at night and generally lowering the tone of your neighbourhood, the Great Irish Exodus tells us what happens when hungry people panic. They move to better parts of the world en masse. And this could be the story of the entire globe in the next 50 years. Unless we solve the issue of food security, the world is facing a Malthusian nightmare on a catastrophic scale. As the rock of the insatiable demand of 7 billion, soon to be 10 billion people, smashes into the hard place of the planet's limited resources to produce that one thing which keeps us all alive, food. And when you drill down, the food dilemma is actually a bigger dilemma. It is an energy problem, and one which is not going away. So that's the downside. The upside is that Malthus's central 19th century prediction that too many people would eventually run out of food has rarely occurred anywhere at any time. We have been a sufficiently ingenious animal in most cases, and when faced with existential challenges, humanity has come up with the technology to increase yields, increase farming productivity, increase supply, and avoid catastrophe. In fact, so successful has this been that the problem for many parts of the rich world is not too little food, but too much food. It's not too many skinny people, but too many fat people. And it's not a medical system which is combating the challenges of malnutrition, but one that is struggling with the challenges of obesity. So let's stand back and look at the big picture. The world's population is moving from 7 billion today to 10 billion in 2050. But this is not really the big issue. The big issue is consumption. It would be okay if we all consumed like Kenyans, but we don't. The Earth's resources are enough to sustain only about 2 billion people at the European standard of living, because on average Europeans, like the average Australian, consumes far more resources than any of the poorest 2 billion people in the world. However, Europeans and Aussies use only about half of the resources of the average American. If all the world's 7 billion people consumed as much as the average American, it would take the resources of over five planet Earths to sustainably support all of us. So either we eat less to allow them eat more, or we are stuck. And it's not just how much people eat, but what they eat. We all know, or at least we do as economists know, that the first habit to change when people get rich is their diet. Here's an example. Of all the many odd jobs I've done over the years, one of the strangest by far was a stint as a red-haired Irish barman in a Chinese restaurant in Toronto, Canada in the mid-1980s. My quite straightforward Chinese colleague told me straight to my face that I smelled horrible. You stink horribly of milk, he groaned, and then went on to tell me that Chinese people don't eat dairy 
and could smell dairy coming out of our pores. Nice. Now years later, when I first visited Shanghai, what struck me wasn't the skyscrapers and the development, but the amount of Starbucks, which we all know isn't really coffee at all, but flavoured milk. So what had happened? In the 1980s, the Chinese didn't eat dairy, but by 2010, they were neck and down pints of milk. What happened was they had got rich. And once they got rich, the Chinese middle class wanted to be like the Western middle class. In fact, as an aside, looking at the amount of yoga, reiki and tai chi outfits here in Sydney, it looks as if not only do the Chinese middle class want to be Western, but the Western middle class want to be Chinese. But that's a different story. Now the change in diet of the Chinese and Indian and Brazilian populations is one of the biggest undocumented stories of globalization. It is driving up food prices dramatically, which are punishing the poorest people in these countries and all over the world, and prompting unforeseen political developments that seem initially unrelated, but are all tied together by the umbilical cord of the global food supply. For example, while much has been made of the yearning for democracy behind the Arab Spring, few of us focus on the destabilizing impact of a 50% increase in the price of wheat in the past few years, which prompted food riots in Egypt, which in turn fueled the political change. Food is politics, and politics is food. And we shouldn't forget this as we move forward, because the price of food is rising, and this will continue to do so. As the world's diet changes, we want to consume more and more meat and dairy. But moving from rice to meat is an enormous production challenge. The UN estimates that the global demand for meat will double over the next 20 years. Now this presents an enormous energy challenge. Because producing a kilo of meat takes 10 kilos of fertilizer, 30 litres of oil, creates four tonnes of greenhouse gas and uses between 15,000 and 70,000 litres of water in a world where by 2050 one third of the globe's population is going to face water shortages. And it's not just water, because all this increased food production depends on the one thing that the world is running out of, oil. The fertilisers, pesticides and transport to grow and move this food around depends on huge amounts of petrochemicals. In short, we are eating fossil fuels. And quite apart from demand, the single biggest driver of the price of food is the price of oil. So we know that we're hitting peak oil, but might we also be hitting peak food? And if so, what's next? One final bit of the equation is gambling. This is where the frothy response to the global financial crisis mixes with the fundamental trajectory of food prices. All around the world, central banks in the US, in Europe and in China are printing money as if it's going out of fashion. And all this money has to go somewhere. Now the central bankers are hoping that it will go into your pocket and you will spend it. And by spending it, you will increase the demand for stuff that I produce and then I will produce more earn more and buy the stuff that you produce and in the process we will all be better off. But that presupposes that the banks will lend money to me and that I will want to borrow money from them. But what if I have too much debt already and I don't want to borrow and the banks have too much bad debt and they don't want to lend? In this case, the tsunami of cheap money has to go somewhere. And guess what food is in the great financial casino called the financial markets? It is a commodity to be gambled on. So the process of bailing out credit junkies in the rich world is driving up the price of survival for billions of people in the poor world. And the more money we print, the higher the price of food. Because ultimately, printing money is nothing more than robbing for consumption today from the resources of tomorrow. The impact of all of this is playing out unevenly here in the West, where food is gradually becoming a class issue. The poor are getting fatter and the rich are getting thinner. In fact, sometimes it feels as though the richer you are, the more you know about food, the more you talk about food, the more you eulogize about recipes, but the less you eat.
The major problem with this diet divide is that the major food producing companies globally want to produce more and more food to satisfy the insatiable demands of their shareholders. And this is then being made, in the West at least, into cheaper and cheaper portions, bigger and bigger portions, and more and more sugary, easily digestible packages, driving up waist sizes and down quality. As this obesity epidemic becomes more and more widespread, the health of the nation plummets and the health cost of the nation rises. Is it any wonder that the fastest growing health budget in the West is the exploding cost of diabetes-related illness and complications? This, ladies and gentlemen, is where the food challenge of the next 30 years is taking us. It is a roller coaster where finance and ecology meets economics, demography and politics and where the outcome is not just about the price or the quality of the food in our shops or at our tables, but the very survival and progression of humanity. In a world where billions of people want what you have and might be prepared to do anything politically, militarily or financially to achieve this.